Okay, so since um, the last talk, last Friday, <coughs> uh, I've been doing my usual practice of uh, flying around the place. That's not levitation, that was in Qantas. Because I uh, accepted an invitation to teach at a conference over in Melbourne, so I was there on uh, Wednesday night and Thursday. Uh, as a conference on depression and anxiety, but I'm not going to talk about those things because I've talked about them many times and anyone who's interested in those subjects is uh, lots of talks about uh, those things. Uh, but so uh, interestingly, when I was over there uh, with many health professionals who were working in the area of depression and anxiety, there were uh, many of the, those professionals came up to me and said how grateful they were of the talks which are delivered here on a Friday night and how many people actually listened to them regularly. And uh, so much so they also knew that uh, I take requests for subjects for talks. So one of the people over in Melbourne said, there's something you never talked about, I want you to talk about it next Friday. And so this is a suggestion which I got from Melbourne on Thursday night. And I, I don't think I have talked about this. It's a bit of an esoteric subject because they asked me to talk about the first couple of days after you die. What happens to you when you die? So I'm not sure if you have any plans for this weekend, but just in case, <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> and it's going to be based on a number of sources. First of all, you've got your own uh, meditation which you know, I've got very strong meditation, if it's not actually memories, it's understanding how the mind works and just how it interacts with the body. And that's the sort of great understanding you get after many, many years of meditation. So you know exactly what's going to happen because you know the nature of the mind, the nature of the body. And there's a particular type of meditation which I've been teaching for a long time now, the jhanas. They're very deep meditations, but you know, I've been quite outspoken about them, what actually happens. And, that gives you a, a very good lot of information about what happens when you die. And I'm going to mention why afterwards. But you've also got <coughs> what we even call like the evidence-based uh, stories of people who either remember their spaces between their lives. And there's quite a few people who can remember those spaces between their previous lives. And either do this spontaneously or they can have um, training to remember that time. And the last piece of evidence, which is perhaps the most um, interesting and uh, the most um, confirming, is those people who have those experiences of dying, either in an accident or in an operation, floating out of their body and being told it's not their time, coming back again and actually giving you some insight into actually what happens when you die. And these aren't just Buddhists, these are just ordinary people from many different parts of life who come back with the same stories. So I'm going to bring all those threads together in this talk about what's going to happen to you when you die. And it's not something which doesn't relate to your ordinary daily life because it gives, <coughs> it highlights that the most important thing in your life is the attitudes, the way you react to what you have to experience from time to time. And uh, you find with this practice which we teach here, it's amazing just what you can do in any situation. You can re react in this beautiful, very positive way. Yeah, positive. Well, what do you mean by positive way? I mean by making peace, being kind, being gentle with these things. Learning from them, accepting them, embracing them, not fighting them, not being negative, not being angry, not being afraid. All these negative emotions which you know in your very life, you know, here today cause incredible amount of problems. They're the ones which might cause problems to you once you, you, you die. <coughs> but let's go back to what happens just before you die. Because that will inform what happens afterwards. Because life is a continuum, it doesn't sort of suddenly change. You know, when you go to bed at night, you wake up pretty much the same person in the morning. Maybe a little bit older, but pretty much the same, at least recognizable. You don't morph into something different. So this is actually what happens even when you die. There's not sort of a sudden morphing into something terribly different. People just before they die, I'm talking about just the slow deaths, you know, of illness, old age, sickness, that type of death, not the sudden deaths. 
but it's uh, a general and very slow sort of uh, turning off of the body. And with that body, what we call the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. It's as if the body turns off very slowly. And I've been very fortunate in my life as a monk. I get to do some really, really interesting things as a monk. I really, really admire and recommend the lifestyle. I do things that you guys will never get to do. It's really exciting, like being with people when they are dying. That's one of my jobs. And to see just the, the death just happening as a process, just uh, what they take as a life force, which is just a body force, just fading away. I remember the first time I saw that, it was quite obvious. There's no point of death. There's no time. You can't actually say that a person died at 8.09. That's what the clock says over there. It's just a whole process which happens over many minutes. The death process starts. and The doctor said it's now finished and it happens somewhere in between. So it's not a point. It's a process. And that's very important to understand. This whole life is a process. It's not an event. So when you understand that, you understand also that if it's a process, that process can continue on. It doesn't suddenly stop. What does stop is these five senses disappear. In other words, no seeing, no smelling, no tasting, no touching. That's actually no feeling. That's actually how we could find out if a person's dead. We poke them, we kick them, we shout in their ear, you know, are you still alive? See if there's sort of the, uh, anything is happening in their body. And a lot of times I think what nurses do or doctors do, they open the eyes and they put a light in the eyes to see if there's any physical reaction, see if there's any response, can they actually see. Now, one of the things I know from meditation is that that's also what happens when you get into some deep meditation. Your five senses disappear. And many of you have got close to that. You're sitting down meditating, you can't feel your hands, you can't feel your legs. Okay, your body's disappearing. Great, that's what's supposed to happen. Now, in meditation, you're not dying. You can actually sort of come out afterwards and you know, fully alive. But in death, this is actually a, almost like a permanent uh, fading away of the senses. But at least in meditation, you get a feeling of what it's like. Number one, when you sort of your body starts to disappear in meditation, it feels good. Actually, it feels bloody good. I don't mind using expletives because that's what it feels like. I don't know about you, but I'm getting old now. This is my 60th year. You get all sorts of aches and pains. I don't know what it's like to be 65, 70, 75, 80, like some of you guys in here, but it gets worse. And I know my body's going to be more aching, more things wrong with it. And it's just so nice to sort of get rid of the body and have a break from it. So when your body starts to disappear, you feel this wonderful pleasure of freedom. You have no aches, no pains. But when I was meditating a few minutes ago, just I had no irritation in my throat at all. You know, this has been bugging me for the last you know, couple of weeks ever since I came back from, from Indonesia. You know, I think it's a bit of a, an allergy. So please, please, please be kind to me and don't give me any medicines. Because the last week I got so much medicines and people put on the internet I was sick and God, I got too much medicine. So please don't do that to me. I got a whole chemist shop. <laughs> So leave me alone, it fixes up by itself. But one of the things I noticed in just the meditation a few minutes ago, all that irritation totally vanished. And it was wonderful, you're actually free and just didn't have any irritation to worry about. This is what happens when the body starts to disappear. You feel this beautiful sense of ease and freedom. And you've got no business to do with seeing things, smelling, and tasting. But many of you will know in your own meditation, doesn't matter if it's very deep or it's just shallow yet, you get deep eventually, just give it time. The one thing which keeps you irritating you most of all in meditation is the sound. You know, like the Ronnie's kid crying outside at the beginning, or somebody else making a noise or coughing. Do you know that's why that we use alarm clocks to wake you up in the morning? Because even the Buddha recognized, and this is one of his teachings, it's actually sound is the last of the five senses to turn off. So when you're actually dying, it's actually the sound is the last thing which disappears. Even that's the way you can actually get into people's uh, minds and get them out of meditation. Remember some time ago there was a guy who just finished a retreat over in North Perth. It was one of my monk disciples who was in a deep meditation. And we were cleaning up, we left him there. But then we were cleaning up, it was time to go. And he was still sitting there. 
So it was my job to try and get him out of the meditation. So, of course, you don't shake him. That, you know, won't feel any shakes. You just talk in his ear and just get him out that way. Sound is the last of the five senses which disappear. Understanding that, in the process of dying, if a person's in a coma, if you think they're just about to go, speak to them. Because of all those five senses, that is the one which is the most likely they will hear. Forget about shaking them or touching them. Sound is the last of the senses to disappear. And many of you will know that when you meditate. So this is evidence-based. So they just start to disappear, the five senses. And when they sort of disappear, there's a great feeling of relief and ease and peace because you know, the body is irritating. This, imagine what it's like when you're really sick and you're dying. That's really a heavy time. Fortunately, though, that in our modern medicines, you know, we get dosed up usually with morphine. I know that many Buddhists have actually asked me, ah, that's terrible, I want to be there when I die. It's an important time in my life. I don't want to be in this dull state. But you don't have to worry about that. Take that morphine. Because what happens during the dying process, that the mind, in this sixth sense, it usually uses your brain, but it doesn't have to use the brain. Once the brain stops and the brain dies, in other words, the mind doesn't need that brain anymore. And it actually can be free of the brain. And what actually happens in the last minutes or two, sometimes more, sometimes less of your life, you get clarity. And I was talking about this, about my mother in London because she's got you know, complete Alzheimer's disease. Two years ago, a year and a half ago, when I went to see her, she just cannot recognize me. She doesn't know who I am. And so I was with her for two years, two, sorry, for two hours. And just talking to her, being with her, she didn't know who I was. Although just strangely, just out of the blue in two hours, with all the talk she said, she mentioned the word monastery which was really weird, and my brother picked up on that. It was totally out of context with everything else she was saying. But there was something in there, just obviously uh, knew that there was something monastic there, you know, with the person you know, she was with. But for people who have such bad Alzheimer's disease, in the last minutes of their life, they will be clear, they will wake up, they will remember everything, because that's the nature of your mind. It uses the brain, for most of your life, but it does not have to use the brain. And at that last few moments of life, it separates from the brain. I remember first reading about that when I was a student. I remember you know, reading widely in literature, and uh, I used to read Tolstoy, and he said one of these stories, it was a fascinating story, because this was uh, over a hundred years ago, that there was a story of a person, quite a wealthy person in his country house who had this sickness and who was uh, in, to in pain constantly, moaning and screaming, literally 24 hours a day, would not sleep. And it was driving all the people in the house crazy. Imagine that you're in a house and there's someone moaning and screaming in pain and there's nothing you can do about it. Being wealthy, they try to get all sorts of therapists, homeopaths, allopaths, everything, but nothing could relieve this person's pain. And there were Tolstoy, you know, a beautiful writer, was describing the emotions of the people who had to deal with this for many weeks. But at the end of the story, he mentioned that everything suddenly went quiet in the house. But the man hadn't died yet. For five or ten minutes, he was free of pain, clear, lucid, before he passed away. And that's so common, and I'm not sure if there's any doctors or nurses who have actually witnessed that. I've witnessed that the last few moments of a person's life are clear. There's a person who comes here regularly, I'm not sure if they're here tonight. They told me the story of they were with their father here in Perth. He was dying, and she was with her sister. They were sitting on either side of the bed holding their father's hand. He was in a coma, hadn't sort of spoken for many, many hours, or a day or two, I'm not sure. And they were just waiting for him to die, just waiting for that last breath to go out and not come in again, holding his hand. And of course, you never know when that moment's going to happen. I've been there with people, and sometimes you're waiting there for hours. 
And they seem as if their last breath, and you think that's it, and then suddenly they breathe in again. And in this particular case, it was his last breath. He stopped breathing. But then he opened his eyes. And he leaned up from his bed and looked around at his two sisters on either uh, two daughters on either side. And they said that without any plan, they said in perfect synchronicity, we love you, Dad. And then he closed his eyes and passed away. But what really took, their, uh, took them by surprise was that even though he was been in a coma for such a long time, even though he was not supposed to be able to see or feel, the last minute he did. He looked them in the eye and they could speak to him the last words. There was an even better example which was in uh, a Time magazine of all things article on the mind. This was the most amazing uh, time when the mind separated from the brain. I think it was, so we did have a copy of this in our monastery, I think 2009 or 10 or something, January edition, <coughs> Time magazine, the mind. But anyway, there was a doctor over in the United States was treating a person with a brain tumor. And it was a very aggressive tumor and you know, he was uh, in hospital, just waiting for the end, in a coma for many days, because apparently the brain tumor just grows and takes over the other part of the brain until there's nothing left you know, for a, a person to be able to speak, or higher brain functions disappear, and eventually the last part of the brain is just used for keeping the body alive, for doing the, the basic functions of breathing and keeping the heart going and the other organs going, but soon there's no capacity left in the brain to do anything, and that's when the person dies. So the fellow had been unconscious for a long time, and the doctor had told him what the prognosis was. You go into this coma and never come out again. But this person did come out. He just again opened his eyes, he bent up. But this fellow talked to his family for 15 minutes, saying their last goodbyes. For 15 minutes he was totally clear before he died. And the doctor was totally amazed. It couldn't have happened, but it did, because by that time there's nothing left in the brain to perform such functions. And I believe I've told many of you, uh, many years ago, Professor John Lorber about the boy with no brain, an honors student in mathematics at Sheffield University. So an honors graduate who <coughs> had a slightly misshaped skull. The doctor gave him a, a brain scan a you know, CT scan, and it was only 1% cortex was there, everything else was missing. Basically, as Professor Lorber said, he had no brain to speak of. And there's no way that that small amount left could actually compensate for everything which was missing. And at that time, when I tell that story, I also want to do research, and I ask people, because his whole head was just filled with cranial fluid, there's no brain there, no gray matter. So I asked people, if you can do an experiment and help me, can you move your head from back to forth? Because if you can hear any sloshing inside, that must be you as well. You've got no brain, it's just cranial fluid. <laughs> but that fellow was an honest student in mathematics, brilliant, normal, had a girlfriend in every which way. You wouldn't know he had no brain. I mean, how can that actually work? And as far as I know, as far as Buddhism knows, your mind that ability to cognize, to form thoughts, to actually exercise will, is independent of your body, especially independent of your brain. And in that last moments of life, that's what happens. Your mind gets free of this brain and this body, so it can become clear. So that's very well documented, that's evidence-based, that when the last moments of your life, you will be clear. So I know the last moments of my mother's life, she'll be very clear. Now what do you do with those last moments? That's the next thing. For those people who have sudden deaths, you know, they experience themselves just outside of their body looking on. And that's an evidence base, that's actually what happens because there's so many people have actually reported sort of the, what they call NDEs, near-death experiences, going out of their body and being, having the experience 
of being able to see and hear but without a physical body. They do experience, they think they've got a body, that's what it's like, but they can see their dead corpse actually on the table or under the car or wherever else they died. And of course, many of those people get revived, they come back again and they tell the tale that that's what it's like. And these aren't just Buddhists, these are from all cultures of the world. And for those of you who want to check me out, the best site for that is of Professor Pim Van Lommel, L-O-M-M-E-L. Because this guy was a professor uh, of medicine uh, in Holland and during his work he had many anecdotes, as many of you have heard this before, of people saying that they left their body on the operating table, they could hear and see what was going on, but was this true or not? One of my favorite stories was of the very wealthy person in London who was having a minor operation and because she was wealthy, she had something, a doctor from Harley Street, very expensive, but she wanted the best. If you got money, why not get the best? And fortunately, she actually did need it because during the operation, she died for a few minutes. And if ever you get an expensive doctor, you'll probably find he's always very polite to you. But during the operation, the doctor lost it. You know, this lady was dying and he was panicking. And during the operation, apparently, he said, he shouted out, even though this lady was unconscious, Don't give up on me now, you bitch. <laughs> That's what he said. Be careful if you're a doctor or a nurse. Because what happened next was when he came around after the operation, they saved her life. They found out the problem and fixed it, so she was fine. But on the first visit of the surgeon after the operation, he said in his very polite voice, Madam, we came jolly close to losing you that time. Yes, she said, I know, but why did you call me a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> Which you can imagine what the doctor thought. She said, you were dead at the time. How would you know that? And then, of course, she told she wasn't dead. Well, she was dead, but she was conscious. And there's many anecdotes like that, and I'm sure you've known anecdotes, and some of you may have actually experienced that. When I give a talk like that, there's always two or three people come up after and say, thank you for talking like that, I've had that experience. I've been out of my body. But this Professor Pim Van Lommel, he wanted to make this much more than an anecdote. He wanted actually to find out scientifically whether this is true or not. And his research, which was reported in the 2001 December edition of Lancet, his research was over three hospitals. He was a professor looking after three hospitals in the Netherlands. And his sample group was every person who came into any of those hospitals under cardiac arrest, I don't know, for a year or two. And of course, those which survived. And everyone who came with cardiac arrest who survived, he gave a questionnaire to to find out if they had any of these memories of what happened during the time they were being resuscitated, the time they were dead. <coughs> and he also recorded what happened in the ER room and in the operating theater, just in case that if they did say that something was said, they can actually find out whether the memory was accurate or not. And he found out of the survivors, about just under 10% of those people who survived did have one or more uh, of the typical uh, descriptions of NDEs, near-death experiences, you know, floating out of the body, hearing what was going on, you know, whatever. And he could verify that these weren't imaginary uh, memories, these were real memories. What they said they heard was said, the procedures they described actually happened. So it was accurate recall. But the most fascinating part of his research was that those 10% or just under 10% were the people whose brain died. And that was what was distinguishing near-death experiences from those which didn't have near-death experiences. The brain actually stopped working and that signaled the beginning of the near-death experience. And the fascinating part of his research was show that there was actually consciousness 
will and the resulting memory happening when the brain was totally not working. And this is what happens also when you get into very, very deep meditation. It's one of the stories of one of our members here. He's not here this evening, but it's a great story. I wrote it down in my book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, with a person's permission. But this was a person who got into such a deep meditation at home, I'll tell it very briefly, that his wife was concerned he died, and so called the ambulance, and it got taken to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. It was on a weekend. He was just an ordinary person meditating in his bedroom, but he was meditating for too long, and his wife checked him up, could find no signs of life, so called the ambulance. Ambulance could find no signs of life, so took him to Charlie Gardner's hospital, where they put ECG and EEG on him. Both were flat. The guy had died, at least. So the instrument said. Now ECG, there was no heartbeat for a long time. EEG, no brain activity. The brain was not working. And he was just in a meditation. I've told the story elsewhere, so I won't elaborate on it. After giving him defibrillators and many electric shocks, nothing worked, but eventually he came out of his meditation. He just decided, I've had enough, now I'll come out, just like you do. And as soon as he came out of meditation, both machines worked perfectly. ECG and EEG started beeping in the proper way. And he felt fine, and he just wondered what the hell he was doing in hospital. He was in his bedroom. And gave him a quick uh, uh, sort of check over the doctor. Nothing wrong with the guy. So he actually went home. He walked home. And he obviously didn't live that far away from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in the Netherlands. He walked back home. He was that fit. But during that whole time, he was perfectly alert, perfectly conscious, but not of his uh, body or his surroundings. He was deep inside. So he was having a wonderful time, one of the best experiences of his life. I say that anecdote because it's a person who comes here because that was actually showing what was happening when his brain had died in deep meditation. It was only a temporary. Real death is when it really happens and you've gone for a long time. So you can actually have evidence and experience of what happens when the brain stops working. Temporarily, we call it near-death experiences. When it happens full-on, full-time, that's called death. So that gives you some evidence of what actually happens. The brain stops working. Number one, it's entirely pleasant experience for just about everybody. Why? Because this terrible body, the burden of it, is actually let go of. You're actually free. My God, that feels good. There's one, just like in deep meditation, I don't know how many times I've told you and I'm just being honest with you, being straight up. I'm not sure if I should say these things, but I do anyway, because I don't want to sort of hide anything from you guys. But the bliss in meditation is better than sex. <laughs> okay, now I, was, I had sex before I became a monk. I've been celibate for the last 40 years, but I've got a good memory, and I know meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and my meditation is very good. It's much better. Now, what that meditation is, is your body disappears, it vanishes. That's actually what happens when you die. So you're actually totally free of this body. It's blissful. But one of those anecdotes, I like these funny stories, you know, which people tell you or you read about. There's this one lady who died on the operating table. And so she left her body, looking at her body over there, just a mess, so off she went. But apparently that she described it as meeting some spirit and the spirit's saying, you know, it's, it's not your time. You know, you've got to go back. And she said, no way. <laughs> I'm having too good a time. I don't want to go back. Sorry. And the spirit said, but you have to go back. I don't care about that. I'm not going. You know, like people are pretty independent these days. And, you know, you don't actually do what you're told by your parents or by the government or by God or anybody. So spirits, you know, go and get lost. I'm having a good time. So that degree of independence, you know, she didn't want to sort of go anywhere. Until eventually having this argument, you know, you've got to go back, no way. Apparently she described, because obviously she did go back, that's why she could tell this story. This spirit sort of got hold of her and threw her back into her body. And it just had all this aches and pains and heaviness again. And she was really pissed off at that spirit. I mean, really big time. 
So when she gave this interview, she said, no, when I die next time, of course I would die eventually, I'm going to find that guy. And I, you don't know what I'm going to do to that guy, what he did to me. <laughs> That's how she described it. The, the fascinating part of that, there's a funny story, was just how pleasant it was, you know, actually to die. And that is actually very helpful for most people. Number one, it, actually everybody who has those experiences, one of the things that they come back again, they always say, now I'm not afraid of dying. Because I know what it's like. It's pleasant. It's actually quite blissful. It's freedom. It's peace. You're having a great time. And of course it's really interesting and important that people know that. Number one, it takes away the fear of your own death. It takes away a lot of the, the grief when someone you love dies. It's okay for you know, priests to say, oh, they're having a good time now. But having some evidence, yes, they are having a good time. I know they're happy. That makes a lot of difference to people. But not all people are happy after death. And you know why? It's because you may be having a lot of pleasure or having a good time, but it's the way that we react to that good time. I don't deserve this. It's not good enough. Or whatever it is. This is just where... Just the way we react to what's happening to us can interfere with this normal, beautiful state of affairs when a person dies. Just like now, you may be having a good time, a happy time, a peaceful day, a great weekend. And how many people think, I don't deserve this? And you mess up your happiness. It can't be right. I'm enjoying myself. That, no, that's just obviously a, a great sort of uh, exaggeration of a very powerful undercurrent in human nature called guilt, negativity, fault-finding. And if you develop that too much in this life, you're going to develop it. It's going to be there for you after you die. And you have this beautiful opportunity to have a good time. And you will throw it away. Why? I don't deserve this. I'm a bad guy. I've done a bad thing. Or just, just sheer fault-finding, negativity, which will stop you being free. Even right now, I spent a huge amount of time in these Friday night talks talking about overcoming guilt, having a positive view of yourself, letting go of the pain of the past, not being a prisoner of any sort of bad things you've done, looking at the two bad bricks, bad bricks in the wall in the context of the 998 good bricks in the wall, getting that not positive attitude but fair attitude to life. I don't like the word positive attitudes of life because you know, that's just overdone. Being fair, being reasonable, being just you know, with yourself. You're not a bad person. I've never met a bad person in my whole life even though I've... I've met John Howard, and I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's all right. He's a good guy. I've met some sort of murderers and rapists in jails. But you know, these are okay people. They've done one or two bad things. But they don't deserve to be hated or destroyed. That's what I mean. I've never seen one person who deserves to be destroyed. There's always some spark of goodness and kindness and beauty in them. And that's a wonderful thing to realize. See that in yourself, for goodness sake. You deserve to be happy. If you want a quick um, explanation of the meaning of life, everyone wants to know the meaning of life, it is you deserve to be happy. That's your meaning of life. And that has huge consequences. Easy to say, but powerful consequences. Which means you can let go of the pain. You can actually access the happiness and the peace and the joy. So after you pass away, the most important thing to do is just to have that kindness towards yourself. To make peace with what's happening. A lot of times fear dominates people's lives. And one of the reasons why I give this talk tonight and thank you for the person who reminded me that I should have given this talk years ago, is to take away your fear. So you know exactly what's going to go on. And you realize it does go on. And this is what happens. 
you are prepared. A lot of times fear is fear of the unknown. When death becomes part of the known, the fear disappears, which means you can relax and enjoy the whole process post-death. When it's fear, you know exactly what's happening, you just let go and enjoy. Obviously, there's many people who just have very, very strong attachments to this world. The people they left behind, the things they left behind. And that's something which again in Buddhism we say, look, you have to let go of that past. You can't carry such things with you. That's obvious, you know that, but you have to learn that, have to train, have to practice to let go of things. When you let go of your attachments, it doesn't mean you don't enjoy life. You enjoy the people you're with. You enjoy the day, but at the end of the day, you had a great day. Now you can go to bed and let it go. Another day coming tomorrow. The great simile of the concert, which is a beautiful simile which I got from my father's death. Yeah, I only knew my father for 16 years. I was not sad about his death. I don't regret that he was only lived 16 years, because wonderful, 16 years with the guy. Just how lucky I was. The great concert, all concerts end. How many people have been to a concert and have burst out crying in grief afterwards? Oh, Justin Bieber was gone. He will never come back to, to Western Australia. Of course not. There's another concert coming back next week. Somebody even more beautiful or whatever. So, you know, just these people come and go. <coughs> The nice thing about it is that that's just life. Life is these series of concerts, these happy moments we have, these joyful times we have, but we know they must end. And so it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy the times we have together because you know, it's going to end, it's going to end. No, we don't allow that to spoil our day. We enjoy it to the max. But when it ends, we feel so grateful. What a wonderful time we've had. Thank you so much. And we move on to the next concert, to the next day. We move on to the next life. And if you can train yourself like that, it's just like even in your meditation, totally let go of the past, free of it, so you can enjoy the moment and allow the future just to evolve wherever it goes. So the same training you use for peaceful, happy, successful meditations right here, in this room, every Friday or Saturday. The same things as what you do when you die. Let go of the past. Don't be afraid of the future. The present moment and making peace, being kind, being gentle, right in this very moment. Please remember that. And the other similes which I've used before, which, you know, they're mostly interesting. The people in the, the uh, anxiety and depression conference, they all took that down as a great little meditation exercise because they hadn't heard it before, the two heavy suitcases simile. Imagine yourself in your meditation carrying two heavy suitcases. The one in the left hand is the past, one in the right hand is the future. And how heavy it is to actually to carry those suitcases. And you imagine yourself putting first down the first suitcase and the second suitcase and you're free of all the burden. So you're in the present moment between the two suitcases of past and future. That's what you do when you die. You let go of your past. You've had a whole life behind you. And in that whole life you have many beautiful experiences, some unpleasant experiences, but remember you have to have both. The unpleasant ones is where you learn. And the pleasant experiences are like the holidays. It's the hard moments, it's like your work. That's where you work, how you learn, you test yourself, you move forward. You learn from those unpleasant experiences. We always call them growing pains. And the unpleasant experiences, that's when you get your paycheck, you're having your holiday, having a good time. That's part of life. But when we die, we let go of the whole lot. We don't carry anything with us. Everybody says you can't take it with you, but you try to, that's the problem. So when you've trained yourself to let go of the past, and you know right now, in this very life, if you can let go of the past, only then can you enjoy the moment. It's amazing how much people actually stop themselves enjoying life because of something which someone said to you or did to you or what you did or said in the past. Why on earth do you do that? It's total loopy stuff as far as I'm concerned. You're crazy. 
So whatever someone said to you, whatever they did to you, whatever you said or did, why allow that to control your happiness in this moment? And I say that to these psychologists, you don't have to do that. And realizing that's one of the most powerful teachings of Buddhism, you don't have to carry the past into the present. You can let it go. It's allowed, it's possible, and it's a great benefit to do that. You can be free. No one is torturing you because of what you did or what someone else did to you. No one is torturing you, only you are. You have to let it go. And a good example of that is like a story which I saw engraved in stone in Bodhapadur, in this great monument in Java, which I hope you've been to. It's a very beautiful monument, ancient Buddhist monument in the middle of Java. But the, and I was very fortunate because one of my mates over there, the monk, uh, Sri Panyawara, a beautiful monk, I try to get him over here many times, but you know he's not that well, and so he can't come. But he gave me the VIP tour of Bodhapadur. His monastery is really close by. So I got this VIP tour, you know, by this, this very great monk around the temple, pointing out all of the, the, the uh, carvings. And it's designed like, you know, like the world system, and the bottom is like the hell realms. And, and I don't know why, that's what I was interested in. You know, people always like horror movies and, and you know, dramas where things go wrong. But anyway, that one of the carvings in the bottom there really took my attention because I could actually see, now this is actually how this death process works. Because it was an, <coughs> an old Buddhist story of a guy who had actually, a you know, pretty good guy, but he did one bad act. He pushed over his mother and she injured herself. And of course he felt so guilty about that that when he died, he got born in this hell realm and he went down to meet this guy you know, in this terrible realm and he saw this fellow you know, having his head cut with a razor wheel you know, just cutting into his head continuously, you know, obviously without him dying. And he's in great pain, but this guy said, at last you've come, because when I got this wheel, it was 600 years ago, because I hurt my mother. And I was told that in 600 years' time, another guy will come, because he also hurt his mum. And when he comes, the wheel will leave my head and I'll be free of this torture and it will go into this other guy's head. And here you are, here's the wheel. So the wheel left this other guy and the guy sort of you know, vanished from this torture and it went into this new guy's head and it was cutting his head in you know, incredible agony. But this fellow, this new guy, he had thoughts of kindness, of compassion. And he said... I'm going to take this wheel, not for 600 years, but for 3,000 years. So the next four or five guys don't have to bear this. I'll take their punishment for them. And of that kind thought, the wheel shattered. And he was taken away from this hell realm and reborn in a heaven realm. Just one thought of kindness and compassion did that. That was not a myth. That's a metaphor of what happens Whatever you have to experience, in fact, what you do experience, is your attitude creates that experience. Your attitude is the creator, creator, the generator. So when you die, please don't have any thoughts of negativity. Because at that particular time, you are creating your world. Yes, there are heaven realms and there are hell realms but you create them, and you make the one you think you deserve. If you're a negative person, and if you think of all the bad things you've done, and have guilt, and haven't let that go yet, at the end of your death, you remember that, and you'll think you're a bad person, and you will think you need to be punished. And you will design the punishment to suit you. Now remember, these states when you're dead, it's the physical body is gone. You're in a mind-made body, mind-made realm. These are created by your mental world. And I just know how powerful that is, your mental world. But because you create it, you can do all sorts of things with it. 
one of these stories just to show you what can be done. Many, many years ago when I started meditating, I was getting into a deep state. My body had gone. And I saw this monster in front of me, like a demon. You know, with big eyes, red eyes. Big fangs in his mouth, dripping blood, fresh red blood. Uh, a necklace of skulls. And this really spiky hair. Ugh, like a tongue hanging out. Ugh. And right in front of me, my meditation. Now, would you guys be scared? A lot of times people ask you because they just don't know what to do. I was wise enough, even by this time, to know how I create the world. And because I knew that I was the creator, and because of my character, the first thing I did was put a couple of sunnies over this guy's eyes. I just needed to think that. And this guy's had like a pair of Ray-Bans over his, his uh, big googly eyes. I blacked out a few of his thang fangs, like I used to do as a school kid, doodling. And I put a cigarette out of his mouth to make him look like some delinquent monster. I think the last thing I did, I put a straw hat over his head with a little flower coming out. I created that monster into something which was totally ridiculous. At which I laughed inside and the monster went and never came back again. Because I created that thing and I could uncreate it with a positive, fun, compassionate mind. And that actually happened to this one guy in our monastery years ago who came to see me. He was staying for a few uh, months or a few weeks. He was actually seeing in every of the paving bricks he see a monster come out of him. He thought he was going crazy. And I told him that technique. One day later, he said, a wonderful day. Amazing how I could create these, these funny pictures out of these monsters. And of course it just disappeared after that. Now this is the power of the creative mind in meditation, especially when you get into deep meditations or when you die, which is pretty similar, when the body disappears, you haven't got so many restrictions you know, caused by solid stuff on what your mind creates. So remembering that at the end of your, uh, when you die, please learn how to create these very positive and beautiful things. And of course you're going to be creating your next realm. You create it. And so by developing a beautiful, positive, kind, loving mind, that's what you're going to be creating for your future. You have that opportunity. I know in some systems that sometimes just, you know, the monks go around and chant or whatever else happens just to try and create that positive mood for the person who's just dead. But sometimes you just can't hear that. You can't see that. At the very least, create it for yourself. Yeah, you will get reborn somewhere, but it's really up to you. And you'll get reborn where you think you deserve to be reborn. You create these worlds. Just the same way that I remember when I was a young kid over in London. I used to go out sometimes for a drink with my mates to a pub. But some people used to go to these pubs in London and there will always be a fight. You know, like I saw it a couple of times. You know, a couple of people would get drunk and they'd have a big punch up outside and blood everywhere. And I thought, why do people go to pubs like that? And the reason is because they like fighting. They're looking for that. And I thought, why do people create these circumstances where they get into this very violence, they get into this negativity, they get into this pain? Because that's what people want. So he asks you, what do you want? What do you really want? Not what you think you want, but what you really want deep inside. Please cultivate the mind, have a beautiful mind, a compassionate mind, a forgiving mind. And that's a place where you, that's what the world you'll create. You create it in this life. I don't know, some of you have difficult relationships. Don't blame your partner. It's nothing to do with your, well, it is to do with your partner, but it's also to do with you. As I said every other week here, it's not his fault, it's not her fault, it's not my fault. Our fault. You're involved in that. So don't just pass a buck to the other. You're involved. Don't just blame yourself. It's us. And because it's all about us, there's always things you can do. So you can actually create a beautiful world for yourself, even in this life. But this life is much tougher because it's got so many solid restrictions, so many barriers. It's tough to create a good world in this life. But you can still do pretty well. 
But imagine just when you're free, when you die, you've got much more opportunities. So don't create a hell realm for yourself when you die. And how do you overcome that? Forgiveness, no guilt. Don't blame yourself, don't blame anybody else. Sometimes when someone does something wrong, I don't know why they did that, but I'm not going to blame them. I don't understand it. I don't understand why they did that, but they obviously thought they were doing the right thing. So there's a great emphasis on forgiveness of other people in Buddhism and a great emphasis on forgiveness of yourself. And that's so paramount when you die. Please forgive. That's why in many of the um, funeral ceremonies which you do, we actually do a forgiveness ceremony. You know, with the people left behind and the deceased. I speak for the person who's died. Say on their behalf, I ask forgiveness. Anything which this person who's just died may have done to any of you by body, speech or mind. Intentional or unintentional. Sometimes just by accident. We really say sorry on behalf of the person who's died. Please forgive them. Let it go. So there can be no pain, no guilt, no idea of sort of justice, which is usually just ideas of revenge, past this point of death. So you can actually be free. And doing that is very helpful. Obviously it's also helpful for the people left behind to actually to let go of the pain of the past. I know it's a beautiful feeling because then you don't have to be suffering from all this terrible stuff of the past. We do make mistakes. And I said, I think last week, Remember the simile of an examination. I used to set test. If everybody got 10 out of 10 or everyone would get 0 or 1 out of 10 in my mass test I, taught, I gave when I was a school teacher, that would be a terrible test. The idea of a test at school is to maybe get about 6, 7, 8 out of 10. Because as a teacher, I wanted to encourage my students, but I also wanted to find out what their weaknesses were. And so when they made a couple of mistakes, ah, I can see where you're weak, where well, I have to put some more emphasis on my next lesson. So the test was actually giving encouragement, but also giving feedback so I can see where the weaknesses are. That's called life. We encourage, so you, you have enough success in life, okay? So you encourage, you're motivated. But when life does go wrong, when you do make a mistake, great. Now that's pointing out some of your weaknesses. So that's where you can actually work and get stronger. So where you can learn more about yourself and about life. But obviously, you know, if the test of life means you're always suffering, you're always having a hard time, everything's always going wrong, that's a bad test. So about six or seven, eight out of ten should be about the optimum test in life. And most human beings are like that. Yeah, you have your fun, you're having a great time, but every now and again, so 20% of the time you have some pain or suffering or disappointment. Well done, that's testing you. Please welcome that. Don't think it's wrong. And so that way we actually can learn, we can grow, and at the end of life, look, school's out. It's over. No more tests. Well done. Enjoy yourself. School is weak. No, death is weak, dead is weak, whatever you call it. Corpse is weak. Have a great time. Enjoy yourself. You've done a lot of hard work. Well done. You've learned. Maybe you haven't sort of graduated left yet. You have to go back next year, but you've done well. So that positive attitude towards yourself and the positive attitude, or rather, you know, the wise attitude to the mistakes and the pain of life means you don't get angry, you don't get negative, which means at the time of your death, those attitudes are just not there. And that stream of consciousness which continues on, you know what that will feel like if you've done some meditation. That would mean that that post-death period is a beautiful period. You can create a heaven realm for yourself. If you want to come back, you can come back here and try again. Learn some more. Get some more understanding. Just move your development further along. Because you notice one life is not enough to really train yourself to really love, to forgive, to know. But you've all done very well just to have enough smarts, enough good karma to come and listen to talks like this. So you're already sort of pretty far on the path. So just take that further. And understand then that that time after the death will be very peaceful, very beautiful. That natural, beautiful feeling of happiness and peace will not be destroyed by any negativity. You can actually go with it, flow with it. I know many people, they start saying they see this person, they see Jesus, they see God, they see 
whatever. But remember, these are mind-made realms. You're not seeing any sort of spirit or being. The person you're seeing is just a reflection of yourself, what you expect to see. Because I know that from the meditations, every time I start talking about that beautiful light, we call it nimitta in Buddhist meditation. It took a long time to realize that's a reflection of my own mind. I learned that because sometimes my nimitta was a bit dull and dirty, and soon I realized I hadn't behaved that day, I'd done something wrong. That's why it wasn't so pure, but other days it was just brilliant and pure and wonderful and delightful, because I'd done a really lot of good work that day. I realized I was looking at my mind and its purity. And that's what actually you see when you die. But don't worry, you're pretty good. You're more than good enough. That's why it looks very beautiful. It's a reflection of you and if you see sort of some light or spirit, don't think that someone else is judging you. No one else judges you. Only you do. You all know that. At least you should do. No one has the right to judge you. Only you do. And the most wonderful thing is to not judge yourself at all. That's why I think last week I was saying in Indonesia when a Christian came up and said, what about Judgment Day? And I said, Buddhists don't have Judgment Day, they have Forgiveness Day. <laughs> it's beautiful, forgiveness, that's love. Judgment is pain, harshness, violence, aggression, judging. Forgiveness, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, you're okay, you're more than good enough. Now that type of judgment, of not judgment at all, but forgiveness, that's actually if you've been training yourself spiritually, when you die actually you see the beautiful light and it's not fearful anymore. It's beautiful loving, accepting, forgiving. So then you can actually merge with it. And you never think about it as some sort of God judging you. Actually anybody who actually sees that light, it doesn't matter if it's a Jesus or a God or a Kuan Yin or whatever they see, it's not these things, remember, this is just what you add on to when you come back afterwards. This is just you. So don't judge yourself. And many people say that's a symbol of love. What is a symbol of love? Forgiveness, accepting, embracing. You come to peace with yourself. Isn't it wonderful to come to peace with yourself before you die? To realize, yeah, you're okay. There's nothing wrong with you. That was such a wonderful insight to have years ago. A last to realize, no matter what other people said, there's nothing wrong with me. Oh, what a relief. I'm now going to disprove that. I'm going over time and I should finish off. And I haven't told today's joke yet. So I'm now going to disprove myself to show there's something terribly wrong with me. I tell terrible jokes. But this is apt. It was told me last week, and a couple of people know this, and it's, it fits in here because it's not just human beings who get reborn, but other animals also get reborn. And I don't know if you know that even penguins, they have this beautiful sense of social cohesion, and, and they have their own ceremonies when one of their members dies. And apparently what happened is this penguin died, and as soon as it died, all its friends came around it to grieve. But then, after grieving for a little while, they actually dug a hole in the snow and the ice and they put the dead penguin in the snow and the ice and they covered him over with the freezing ice. And then afterwards, they did a little ceremony for, for the dead penguin, their friend. They sang a song. Freeze the jolly good fellow, <laughs> freeze the jolly... <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the worst jokes I've ever said on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless it just shows my attitude I'm a fun with whatever I have to do in life please keep that attitude and you know that's actually how you deal with the end of your life and then you get a beautiful rebirth or even no rebirth at all if you can totally let go but if I keep on carrying on because I've got over three minutes past nine you'll all die before I finish this talk so it's a waste of time so I'm giving you some information about the attitudes towards death, which is also reflects your attitudes towards life. No girl, please forgiveness, you deserve to be happy. Just go with it. Mistakes in life, things which go wrong, it's part of the exam, it's the meaning of life, learning. You know, if you get 10 out of 10 every day, there's no meaning to life at all, you're not learning anything. So when it gets hard, when it's hurting, 
growing pains, learn from it. You're becoming a better person. Tough, hard, but my goodness, it is actually good for you. So thank you for listening to the talk this evening about what happens after you die. Thank you. So, is there any questions about this evening's talk or comments? Yes, go on. I said, please make it quick because people are already leaving. Exactly. Con the pain disturbs the consciousness, the morphine disturbs the consciousness, but go for the morphine, go for the painkillers, because that's only up to the time when real death starts. Once the real death starts, once you leave the, mi the brain, you're absolutely clear. So don't be afraid of that, even if your Buddhist, I want to be there when I die, you will be. So it just takes away the, the irritation and the disturbance of the pain. You've all heard me teach meditation for many years. How gentle I am when I teach you meditation. Don't keep sitting if it's painful, just move. Because pain is disturbance for developing the beauty of the mind. The same when you are dying. Take the morphine. Get into a, as comfortable position as you can, physically, so you can forget about the body. Yeah, you will be dull for many, many sort of hours you know, before your death. Your actual death happens. Once a death happens, the brain turns off, just like Professor Pim Van Lommel noticed, then you're free. That's when you can start really practicing, remembering all you've been taught, practicing peace, kindness, love, forgiveness, because then you can do that. If you've got pain, I agree that pain takes precedence. You can't even think about any dumb, you're just dealing with the, the agony and the, the demands of the pain, which takes precedence over everything else. It shouts the loudest. Absolutely true. Great. Any other comments or questions before you die? <laughs> yes. Yeah, life after life. Yeah. Yeah. There's many, many books like that because there's the evidences there. Lots of people have researched. Lots of honest people, you know, said what it's like. So get out there and see that evidence because it's going to happen to you. So read those books before it's too late. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen next? <laughs> anyway.